So first thing I'm going to do is withdraw the needle into the outer sheath, which is an approximately four finger distance over here so that I'm never introducing the sheath with the needle exposed. There's no reason to cut my fingers or potentially cut a sheath, which may or may not be reinforced. So I've got it separated back over here. I'm going to keep that angle and I'm going to let the curve of the sheath inform how I'm going to manipulate the needle set as we enter the hepatic vein. And now as we get into the hepatic vein, I'm going to intensely rotate it to match. Can we go up one mag, please? I'm going to draw the wire back. Let's remove the wire completely. I'll take a syringe of contrast. Okay. And I'm going to bring the non-radiopaque sheath, which will exit first in the hepatic vein. And we can see the plastic tip there. That's as far as we'd like. Let's center a little bit more caudal. It's nice to have controls from the tabletop here. That's great. Okay, and let's lessen the mag one. We don't need as much magnification and that means lower doses. So next with the sheath out to the very tip, I'm gonna bring the needle to its very tip so that they're mated. Then I'm gonna hold the sheath, the outer sheath, and bring the call pinto sheath back to mate that. So these two are now one unit together. I'm gonna to sign them to my right hand. And you see that nothing's advanced beyond the point that we were at before, so the needle doesn't move in an uncontrolled fashion. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually intensely turn the needle system anteriorly so it takes a bite out of the bottom wall of the vein and is secure. And that way with the patient breathing I'm not going to be surprised and find it migrate back, which is often a point of difficulty of having with respiration things slowly move backwards unintentionally in the vein. The next thing is to move the outer sheath back Check it on fluoroscopy. We want to leave the needle room to exert its curve unimpeded by the outer sheath. So essentially I think of trying to compartmentalize the tasks that each hand has and it hands them back and forth and you'll see that in just a moment. At this point I can control the entirety of the system with one hand leaving me free to screw the needle on the syringe on or off of the uh, needle assembly without having this rotate and losing ground. And that's essential in puncturing uh, any small portal vein and even moving with the patient with respiration trying to keep the needle in place and not having to move in and out of that so very important to have each hand essentially controlling needle position and rotation so at this point we can now bring the apparatus back and prepare for our puncture I'm going to bring the sheath back even a little bit more and now I have the needle intensely rotated anterior and a little bit beyond on purpose during withdrawal and as it comes back, it's generally going to make a little skid into a somewhat more vertical position. If I wanted to, I could inject here and show you where I am in the hepatic vein, as you saw. And in a moment, there's that little skid that always happens if you're turning a right and the first needle pass. Okay? That happens to be a really firm uh, liver. I can feel that. Immediately what I did was take over everything with my left hand from the sheath, the middle, call pinto, cover for the needle and then the needle itself. The entire thing is now controlled, nothing is moved, and I can free my hand to simply aspirate. There are occasions where a core of liver may have actually been captured in the needle uh, during that needle pass. This used to be the way that we did liver biopsies. So it's important to make sure that this isn't one of those livers where that's occurred. Otherwise we'll be aspirating and never see blood return because there'll be a plug of liver. So let's have one mag up and I'm going to try to inject the smallest dot of contrast and indeed it felt like there was a little plug of liver in it so it's good that we got that clear. Now the next step is going to be withdrawing slowly so I'm going to assign my rear fingers, little fingers, to the sheath. I'm going to keep the rotation with my back end and then I'm going to push back with my thumb and that allows me to keep everything in place while aspirating with my back hand. So the needle's always under control. I'm going to keep the bubble up out of it. And if I want to inject, I'm going to take over the whole system again, relax the plunger, and then make a little puncture in case I wanted to see whether there was blood return or not, or whether I'd sufficiently cleared it. And you can see the small stain there. 
assuring me that the needle's free. And then reversing back, plunger, moving the hands back, grabbing the needle. So it's always in control. And then I'm going to push back with the thumb. The back hand is aspirating and also controlling rotation. There isn't much need for fluoroscopy at this point. But I do want to keep in mind when I'm approaching the hepatic vein because I don't want to skid back in the hepatic vein and land in the vena cava. We do want to make sure that we're in the liver. And there are little tiny branches of portal vein that we're seeing on fluoroscopy. And there's a little bit of return there. Hand it off to the front hand and inject a little bit of contrast. And we're seeing in the background some portal vein branches, but not a clear way down. We'll spend a moment on that with the wire, as unlikely as that is. We'll quickly take that wire. On the small chance that this might, in fact, lead us somewhere, even though there really wasn't a clear path down. And what I suspect is we're filling that portal vein by wedge or by tiny branches that won't lead us there, but you never know. So let's find out. Take that torque device. Thank you. We've got the lights up a little bit brighter in the room than I usually were, would have so that uh, you can also see on camera. And now I'm just gently manipulating the wire. And what I'm feeling is that I'm really just in parenchyma. And we don't really want to carve around with this wire because we can easily create a parenchymal defect and a pseudoaneurysm, especially in a less cirrhotic liver, even though this is pretty fibrotic. So that's not leading anywhere. What I have been doing is rotating the needle slightly and moving it back on the off chance that I was just about to enter a portal vein branch on the way back. And that's not the case, even though there was a little bit of blood return. But honestly, if you don't try those types of entries, you miss opportunities. So I'm going to ask you to remove the guide wire completely. And I'll take that syringe of contrast. We'll go ahead. I'll take a clean syringe, which is why we half filled them. We are still getting blood return, which is notable. So we're going to inject again. And there's a little space there that isn't necessarily clearly veined. Some of it is my making. And there's even a little bit of a suggestion of a cast of what might be the outside of the portal vein. But I don't see a direct entry. I see some periportal collaterals, I think. So I'm going to draw back a little bit, and I'm going to redirect a little bit, start a new pass. And then again, I'm just going to make sure that the needle is clear, which it is. A little bit of spill back in the hepatic vein. And then again, the same procedure. Angle control with the back hand pushing forward, the trailing fingers are holding the sheath in place, the outer sheath, the call pinto sheath is being pushed. Let the needle rotate just a little bit there. Get a better seal. And see if we can find a suitable branch. So I'm typically looking for some clue to portal vein entry or at least a portal vein branch within a few punctures. It's bubbling a little bit, and while there isn't return, that's often a clue that we're about to enter something or near. And in this case, we're getting the early clue to the hepatic vein. So that's hepatic vein filling, but sometimes the portal vein is nearby. So what we're going to do is not fall into the hepatic vein and have to reposition, but in fact rotate the needle once again and then advance. And redirect a little bit within the tract. Have a new syringe. We can bring that table in a little bit, perhaps. Okay. It'll puff to make sure the needle's free. So there are some little vertical lines of contrast that are still resonant on the screen. These don't look like lymphatics, so lymphatics can fill. I think they're portal systemic collaterals, but sometimes they may outline the location of the main portal vein. Somebody once called that the tunnel sign, which is injecting a lot of contrast 
inadvertently around the portal vein and recognizing that you've outlined it in relief, which might allow you to puncture in the inside of it. It's not an elegant approach, but you take whatever toehold you can if doing this for fluoroscopy without, say, intravascular ultrasound or external ultrasound is has been performed in some European labs. So now we're slowly moving into some blood return, as you saw. I move very, very slowly. And then let's see if we've got something. So we have what looks like a curious hepatic vein collateral there that flowed caudally and then emptied into the hepatic vein. And surgeons know that there are many more hepatic veins than what we see alone. We think of just left and right. I'll take a fresh syringe. So I pulled back out of that so I wouldn't completely refill the syringe with contrast, and yet it continues to fill. There are occasions where I'll move to a coaxial skinny needle, and there's blood return again. We'll find out if this is the hepatic vein filling, which it is, but I'm also sensitive to the fact that the portal vein may be very close by, and I don't want to miss the fact that I could enter a portal vein within a very short distance of the hepatic vein, the so-called cramp room. Now, the other thing is, if I'm not going to have any success, I'm going to curve the needle even more to try to get more of an anterior passage. And you see me trying to make sure that I'm not making the same needle pass again and again. So I just change directions just a little bit and position in hopes of being in a different place in the parenchyma. And indeed, this is a liver that is getting a core sample with the puncture, which is why I injected that tiny little bit of contrast. That probably happens about one of 10 cases. And I'm just pushing back with my leading hand thumb. And I got a little spray there, as you saw. But it so you can see that we filled a bit of the portal vein. Let's flora store that. And we'll run that floor again so we can look at that. And what I filled is a peripheral branch that flows cephalad and then makes a turn into the portal veins. Now, even though we could get a wire to make that upward turn and go down, we're never going to be able to pass our sheath and the rest of the equipment around that turn. So as much, so we've demonstrated that we can hit a portal vein branch pretty quickly, and that tells us that we're in play, but that's not going to get us where we need. The question is, will a digital subtraction provide us more localization of the central portal vein? And because this creatinine is normal, I'll just do that run. Okay, we can see this gives us already a sense of how small his liver is in that sea of ascites by how crowded and how quickly the portal vein branches are approach the edge of the liver. But it also shows us the general location of the right portal vein. We may have to curve the needle a little bit more. But I also want to highlight that we've punctured a branch that is the size or smaller caliber than the needle. And if that were a straight line downwards, we'd use that. And that's why it's very important to be able to control hand position. So and having said that, that ain't going to work for us. And yet. That's really the branch that we want to hit, but just pulling back is not going to put us in there because that's in a different anatomic location. And indeed, when we get on top of it, it might as well be a mile away, even though it could be just two millimeters front or back. So, and in fact, this is the location that we've been making our puncture. So we didn't really need CO2, we just need 3D. So I've punctured in that general area, but I may have to curve the needle a little bit more to get front or back there. And I want to make sure that the needle isn't clogged, so I puffed a little bit. I crossed my fingers, but they're busy holding the sheath right now. And there's blood return. 
and there's a better portal vein branch. So let's see if we can convert this one. Store flora. It's a little, still a little bit in the peripheral juncture of two small branches. It's not that larger right portal vein that was transiently visible on fluoroscopy, but it might be a toehold. So very important to keep your left hand still, keep the needle still. His respiratory excursions are relatively little, so I don't have to do a lot of rocking in and out with him to keep the needle in place. And I'm getting resistance. And that's the needle, that's the wire coiling in a non-space. So I'm gonna leave the wire out and I'm gonna back up the needle slowly, keeping the bevel orientation in hopes that I can be in the branch. And the question is, are we in or could we have actually left the liver capsule? So now we'll lessen the magnification and we'll position a little bit more caudally and try to determine that. We haven't left the capsule, so I, I'm not suggesting that we're there, but it is a very important thing to consider at each point. So it looks like we're entering the large splenic vein, and you saw that we entered a vein that really didn't look like it was a straight line at all, and yet with a little bit of manipulation, we've managed to move it down into the main portal vein. So really the way that I view portal vein puncture is the skills that are needed are stabilizing the hand so there isn't chaos over here so that any sized needle and portal access can be converted into an entry.